You're listening to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast, a place for sex addicts to share their experiences of recovery, to help break the stigma, myths, and misconceptions of sex addiction. This podcast may contain topics of sexuality, sexual trauma, dysfunction, or other things that may be triggering. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. My name is Jason, I'm a sex addict, and I will be your podcast host for today. What's going on everyone? Welcome to episode number 27 of the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. I've had a nice few weeks of getting some rest, uh, going out camping while I was on vacation from my work, and away from doing recordings for the podcast. I believe that I had mentioned in previous episodes that we were hoping to get the clearance to use recordings from the Bay Area Speakers Meeting, which is a joint SAA and COSA event where we have a speaker from SAA and a speaker from COSA. It was our partner program. I will be speaking a lot more about the COSA side of it in the next episode. I was toying with the idea of sharing both of the speakers in one episode, but I decided to break it up into two to give the focus to each individual speaker. I believe this was either the second or third installment of the quarterly speakers meeting that the Bay Area has been doing, and I'm excited that I get the chance to share these recordings. I may look back to see if I can share the uh, some of the previous recordings that we've done, but I finally got the go-ahead to share these ones on the podcast. In the next episode, Carrie M. will share her story of what it's like to be in COSA, and she's been in COSA for 19 years, and I'm excited to start sharing some COSA stories. It's really important that for both SAA and COSA to hear each other's side of the story. Like I said before, we'll get into that in the next episode. In this episode, we'll be sharing the story of Jeannie O, who is the first woman in SAA and has 40 years of sobriety. I'm so grateful that the SAA and COSA Speakers Committee was able to get Jeannie O from Minneapolis to be able to share her story at this quarter's meeting. Before getting to her share, I wanted to read a little bit out of the Green Book, and this comes from the stories, a pertinent story called A Phone Call Saved Her Life. And this is story number two, the bottom of page 116 and top of 117. In my first years of SAA, my sisters, all peers, strove together to transform the chaos of each of our lives and reestablish integrity. From them, I realized that honest sharing with no need for sexual barter was the prerequisite for intimacy and committed love. Getting into SAA was not all that easy. The stigma of being identified as a sex addict could keep prospective members from seeking a group. Those desperate or courageous enough to seek out a program often confronted barriers designed to protect present members. For its first three years, the women's group met in private homes. The growth, stability, and cohesiveness of the women's group depended on the commitment of present members to the newcomers. We were exquisitely sensitive to a woman's special needs as she was introduced to SAA. If you haven't read the story, it's an amazing story, and we'll get to hear more in this episode. And I wanted to move on uh, to page 118, and this is down towards the bottom. SAA's first formal contact with the media had occurred in 1982. From then onward, we relied on the 12 traditions, just as AA had always done. Anonymity was reverenced by us and respected by the media. I participated in several TV, radio, and magazine interviews on behalf of the women in the program. My story became a means of reaching others. Thus, the pain and humiliation of my acting out days 
had become transformed into something meaningful and life-enhancing through the alchemy of recovery. I selected these readings for a couple of reasons. One was the important aspect of starting a women's group in order to feel safe, but also the line in here. Those desperate or courageous enough to seek a program often confronted barriers designed to protect present members. And I have certainly felt this um, in some of my men's meetings, men's only meetings, uh, where we were pondering uh, opening up to be a mixed meeting, some successful, some not successful. And I feel the need for mixed meetings. I feel the need for men's only meetings, uh, um, meetings for women only, or however you identify, um, BIPOC meetings, all sorts of different specialized meetings in order to feel safe and heard and respected. I really hope that hearing stories like this opens us up into being embracing for all of us. The other part of this reading that I really liked was the second part that I read was talking about sharing the story with the public media and how important that is. Um, I have not been courageous enough to be on TV, radio, or magazine interviews, but definitely sharing stories here on the podcast and getting it out there into the public is an important thing to help others who are suffering and to provide a place for them to come and seek help. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeannie telling her story at the quarterly Bay Area SAA COSA speaker meeting. Trepidation whenever I come before a group. And part of that comes because I have a tendency to match my insides with other people's outsides, and I don't come off well at all. And I was thinking about that in preparation for this meeting, and I decided that part of that's because secretly I'm a duckbill platypus, and too often I find myself in a puddle full of ducks or worse yet, a, a bevy of swans. But in speaking to this group in particular, people who understand that discrepancy between insides and other people's outsides. I'm safe in declaring to you that my name is Jeannie and I'm a duckbill platypus and a sex addict. Um, I was told that, you know, the format would be how it was, what happened, how it is now. And for me, that generally boils down to what I did to cover up that discrepancy between inner and outer self and what happened when I was able to face my addictions and uncover that and begin to recover. And the how it is now part of my life is more about the discovery. And um, so to start out with the cover-up, I'd have to tell you that I'm a middle child, born of a middle child, in the middle of the previous century, in the middle of the Midwest, where child rearing is what I would call pretty close to the Middle Ages. Um, by that, I mean that um, children were to be seen and not heard, and girls were expected to be outstanding without standing out. And um, it was a time before the invention of self-esteem, because at the time, anything that resembled self-esteem was considered being uh, too big for your britches. And it's in that arena in which I grew up. It was also the Middle Ages as far as dealing with uh, child sex abuse, and I was abused as a young child from the time I was two and a half by a, a neighbor whose name was Leo, the lion I used to call him. And I was sexually mauled by him for some time. And this continued. And I thought at some level, I thought that if I were beautiful or loved 
or good, protection would follow, and that someday I would be something like that and I would be safe. But um, I was taken to the doctor, and I remember the doctor visit, and I remember sitting outside the doctor's office on a hard wooden chair with my mother and the doctor in the other room and the stucco glass of the doctor's office. And I, I didn't experience any protection for this intervention, this medical intervention, because I thought it wasn't considered beautiful or good or loved enough to be protected. And doctors were expensive. And when this man who molested me died when I was seven, I had further abuse from um, more like lion cubs pre-adolescence and adolescence in the neighborhood. And there still was no protection. But what was hard for me, harder in a sense, harder than this, was what I experienced in my family when I was 10. There are six people in my family. I have an older brother, an older sister, and a younger sister. Excuse me. And um, the family had gone on a family function at a church one um, afternoon and left my younger sister in the care of a teenage babysitter, my brother's friend. And after the babysitter had left, my little, my little sister reported having been molested. And my whole family was frozen like pillars of salt. We were all motionless. No one moved to say anything to my little sister. And finally, my father went to the phone and um, went to dial the number of the parents of this teenager. And I remember him stopping midway and saying to my mother, that my father did not know what to say to the family. And so he hung up the phone. And what paralyzed me more than this sort of Gomorrah-like setting of six pillars of salt was the fact that my little sister was beautiful. She was good and she was the most loved member of our family. And still there was no protection for her. And it was my experience that afternoon that there was no protection available. I'm going to advance 20 years and it's 1977 and I'm in treatment for alcoholism. And um, it was at a time when there was no understanding or very little understanding of co-addiction. I think that they had a notion that you could be alcoholic and a gambler or alcoholic and abuse drugs. But they had much, no, not much more sophistication than, than that. And so when I presented uh, problems I was having with sexually acting out, I was told that it was a function of the drinking and that if I sobered up, that problem would clear up automatically as a function of my alcoholism. And for three years, I tried to believe that that was true. I stayed sober for those three years, but was secretly saving up for a relapse. In the summer of 1980, three years after treatment, it was a beautiful August day. And um, I was planning on relapsing that evening, but I knew that it, I wouldn't really feel comfortable living with myself if I didn't use the phone list that I had from AA. And I called seven members on the list without reaching anyone. And for those young enough, for those too young to remember, um, there were very few voice machines who had no answer, busy signal, or you got a hold of the person. And your next option was a postage stamp. So when on the eighth call, I got hold of somebody finally, I was astounded. And it was a friend of mine, Raul, who I expected to be out of town on a gorgeous August afternoon in what we call up north is where the wilderness and the lakes are. But he was home and he was available. And we, went at, we met at a restaurant called the Leaning Tower Pizza for supper. 
and uncharacteristically, I told him what was going on with me. And so he suggested that we go for a walk around Lake Harriet, which is near downtown Minneapolis, a three mile circuit. And on, the, on that trip around the lake, been, for the first time in my life, I shared with him what was really happening as far as the men in my life. And we rounded the corner towards the parking lot and I expected to be able to make it sober through that night when Raul stopped me and he said, why don't we go around the lake one more time? There's something I want to tell you about. And we did. On the second circuit of the lake, um, <clears throat> Raul told me about his own problem with sexual acting out and about this new program called Sex Addicts Anonymous that had been started three years earlier, the same summer that I was in treatment, by four therapists walking the same lake that he and I were walking. And um, he said that he thought that program might fit for me. And I thought I can handle a room full of men who are sex addicts. And he said, well, oh, better check with the group first. And uh, he checked and the men said that they weren't ready to take on any women yet, but I should wait. And um, they would get hold of me, get back to me. And as it happened, I had to wait three months from August, end of August to the end of um, November, beginning of December, when I heard from Raul that, um, that they had uh, three more referrals. The referrals to the original SAA group were met, met, made from the network of therapists all knew each other. They would have their clients write to a post office box. And finally, they had three other women to meet with me. So in a basement church in um, St. Paul, we met three other women, me and two of the men from the men's group who, and the men in the men's group said, this is how we run our meeting and it's up to you to um, figure out how to use yours, how to run yours. And the men left. Sitting across from me was a woman named Barb, wasn't sure she belonged. A minister, a pastor, a woman who was a pastor who had driven 250 miles from Madison, Wisconsin to meet that evening. And the, the fourth person was Peg. I remember her very well. She was acting out at, the, at her factory job and she was the sole source of income for her single parent family. And in the next week, there were three of us. But I kept, and that same night, I relapsed and went to go on to for a three month drunk, which was my initial week months of uh, SAA. But I had the keys to the church, which meant that I had to show up in order to open it up so that others might show up, could show up. And it was the keys to the church that kept me in the program for those early months. But by March, St. Patrick's Day, really, of 1981, there came a time in which I came to accept my powerlessness over alcoholism and my identity as a sex addict. And that to me is the most important birthday of my recovery and it's the one that I celebrate. And it's when the covering up and the uncovering and the recovery came together on that one day for me. At the same time with the group, we were down to two, just Barb and me. We had, we had three referrals from the post office box. So we had to figure out what we were going to do with these new women. And we were contemplating the picture of the famous painting of Dr. Bob and Bill W. at the hospital bed of the sick drunk. That's a painting that you see in any Allen O club and, and lots of depictions of early days of AA. And we looked at that and we realized that Dr. Bob and Bill W. and the drunk 
had no idea what they were doing, and either did we. And something came of what they did, so maybe we could do something like that. So we hit upon the notion of devil teaming sponsorship so that we could learn sponsorship from one another and offer two kinds of support to the new person. The other thing that we got from our, uh, our brainstorming about how we wanted the meetings to get, go along was a sense that we had to keep the meetings safe. We didn't want it to be a, a revolving door. We didn't want it to be a goldfish bowl. So we decided that if we were going to go out on a limb to share our stories to a stranger and extend our support to another sex addict, we wanted to get from them a six week commitment to stay with the meeting. And in return, that woman would get um, orientation into the 12 steps as they apply to SAA, would get used to the group, the group would get used to her, and she would also donate some form of service to the group. If she was willing and it was there was definite a need, definitely a need, she could go on and co-sponsor the next new referral at the end of the six weeks or offer her home or all the other different sorts of service opportunities that were needed. But one of the most important things we learned, we taught her during that time, and I don't know that it's something that's been explicitly taught, consciously taught, is how to use a sponsor. You know, a lot of times we um, operate under the dysfunctional rule of, I shouldn't have to tell you, know, you should know without my telling you how to use a sponsor. I shouldn't have to tell you that you need to call me as a sponsor. You should know that without my telling you that. Um, another thing is that uh, orientation to the 12 steps is something that's personalized and has to be taught. I'm into the discovery part of my speech already. Um, I see that the 12 steps is something that needs to be taught as it applies to Sex Addicts Anonymous. So often I've heard people say, well, the 12 steps are there, they can read them, especially now on the internet. But most people experience who are not in a 12 step group is what they understand about 12 steps or AA from the movies. And if you look at the movies, you would be under the impression that AA and it's fellow uh, organizations are a three-step group. You sober up, you apologize, and you convert. Obviously, there's more to it than that. And that has to be taught. One has to be oriented. One has to be immersed in that. And then for those who come to the group with other 12-step backgrounds, your credits transfer. But how to apply those 12 steps from NA or Al-Anon into SAA have to be taught. And so often I find that people are dropped into groups without sponsors, expected to understand what the 12 steps are, or expected to use what they know about them and adapt automatically. And in a sense, we're expecting people who speak, say, Spanish, because they speak a foreign language like Spanish or Al-Anon, that they should be able to speak German. And the way you speak German is by immersing yourself in the language, not by, given a, get, not by being given a text or even a brochure. One of the other important things that um, we learned to use back then and that I think is still applicable to new, new groups is the importance to immerse somebody in the 12 steps right away that even though the number is 12, I think of step one and step 12 are really the entry points of the program that they close the circuit. And once the circuit is closed, power can flow. 
we come to this toast, we come to SAA out of desperation, but often what keeps us in and keeps us coming back is our commitment to serve. The reason that I came back to the second and third and fourth and 40 years of SAA is originally I had the keys to the church. That little piece of service preceded my ability to understand what powerlessness was. I was not responsible to myself initially, but I was responsible to other people. And it, it's backwards, but that's how, that's how my sobriety built up. Um, one of the things that happened originally in the, in the original um, women's group is that the 12th step was tied into other things we did as well. We knew that we needed literature as we were getting more and more referrals through our post office box. And so what we did is we had a regular meeting in one woman's home. And on weekends, we had a working retreat. And in the working retreat, it would probably be an 11-step retreat. We would meditate on a subject like abstinence and boundaries, intimacy, sexuality, spirituality, um, whatever. And um, each of us would go off and write and write and write and then come back the previous, the next week and have uh, produced, typed, mimeographed, uh, reproduced, Xeroxed, whatever, what we had written and compiled literature that way. For instance, that's one way. And one of my things that I remember doing is I had such an adverse reaction to the big book's approach to four step based on the seven deadly sins that I wrote it, a four step guide early on um, about the same time. So that was the 11th step, but it was tied to service as well. About the same time um, was when we got our first um, intergroup leader. I call him St. Marv, and he worked free for a number of years. And he needed people to write starter kits. And so the women's group, by default, had become the literature arm of the, of the um, SAA organization, and we wrote starter kits for other parts of the country, you know, and um, we took on postal sponsoring. This long distance was expensive. Um, I remember one of my, my postal sponsor in North Carolina was a single parent with five, five children under the age of 10, um, living in a trailer park whose sole recovery was our letters. So we've come a long way, and yet there's a long way to go. Um, we had to sponsor right away before we knew what we were doing because it were dust bowl days, and still it worked. I don't think you need to complete the whole circuit of 12 steps to know how to sponsor. I don't think you need to con complete the whole 12 circuit of 12 steps to do 12 steps service, phone support, making coffee, all of these contribute to buying in to the group. We're heard and we're social beings and addressing that social aptitude, that social interest is what can keep us sane. Um, let me see where I've got, I've got to look at these notes, hold on a second. So, um, one of the other things I wanted to mention is that I have a personal passion for face-to-face -face women's groups. And what that has to do with for me is that I believe that women need a forum in which to address their own self-prejudice. And that doesn't necessarily happen as easily in a mixed group. I know it happened for me in the face-to-face -face group in which I was, and I've seen it happen for others that way, that I needed to be friends to be able to be intimate with women 
as peers, not as judges, not as competition. And that was the groundwork for recovery for me, and it has been for a number of other people. And I need to see that. I mean, I am encouraged when I see that option available. Um, the other thing that was important to the early group, and <laughs> excuse me, continues to be important, and I don't know if you do it, I don't know how it operates um, in, in any large measure, just seemed piecemeal here and there, is, is group inventory. And one of the things that we used to do it at the end of the 12 step cycle, but it seems to me that the, in, the circles of recovery can be applied to the group as well. In other words, there's inner circle group dynamics, there's middle circle and there's outer circle. And when a group is doing an inventory on itself, it can look at its inner circle quite honestly. Are we, what, how sober is our meetings? Is there a lot of relapse in our meeting? If so, what do we need to do to step up? It's not just the relapsed person and, the, and sponsor who need to step up. And more importantly, where does 13th step fit in with inner, the inner inventory, uh, inner circle inventory of the group? Where is our group in particular on inner circle behavior? Middle circle behavior, I think of how is the responsibility of the group being shared? Is it being distributed equally or is, or is there a heavier burden falling on others? Um, how is the list being maintained? How, are, how personal are we in our accountability to newcomers? How much of an outreaching are we doing to follow up on somebody who's going for a rough time but not necessarily relapse? surgery or a divorce or whatever, you know, how humane are we? Those are middle circle behaviors. Outer circle behaviors, I think of as just enjoying each other, working retreats, kayaking trips, whatever, you know, enjoying the fellowship with or without the structure of program. And when you look, there's, there's inner, there's middle, there's outer, and then there's something beyond that, and that's the vision. And I, I see the vision of the program as more the international piece, the piece of people who are bilingual using their language outside of their state, outside of their city, possibly outside of their country, and helping the support and, and growth of, of new groups there. Um, I want to, um, for instance, there's one woman in London. Um, I heard that there's going to be a, a women of color group. And I thought, as far as this vision of outside of their group, I think of this woman I know in London whose uh, pattern is avoidant shutdown pattern. She's a, a Muslim culture that ha has a lower a, a power esteem for, for women. And in in the United Kingdom, they don't use the green book, they use the book of AA, the big book. And so she has to try, go into an uh, SAA group in which she's one of 45, the other 44 are men. She has her issue with avoidance. Others are more acting out more commonly. She has to take the big book and translate the dialogue and perspective of Yankees who were writing 80 years ago about alcoholism from male perspective and make sense of that as a sex addict. That's part of where the group can go ultimately is in literature and cult cultural translation of our recovery to people like her. I just want to close in saying that you are all beautiful and loved and good. And your protection comes from protecting yourselves and protecting each other. Thank you. Thank you so much. Many thanks to Jeannie for sharing her experience, strength, and hope with us. It was an amazing story. I'm grateful for all that she has done for SAA as a whole. 
and for being a trailblazer for the, all the women here in SAA. I wanted to mention a couple of links to things that might be of relevance. Uh, first off, towards the end of her share, she was talking about taking group inventories. And the ISO has a group guide, which is a handbook for SAA groups. And on page 35 of that, uh, there is a section on taking a group inventory, a list of example questions and things that you can be doing to make sure that your meetings are healthy. A couple of my meetings have done this, and we seem to do it every every few years. It's not something that we do annually, but it is a good thing to make sure that we're doing what we can to make sure that our that we're reaching out to the newcomer, that we're uh, staying within the traditions, things like that. So, if you are interested, I'll be sharing a link to the group guide, and again, that would be starting on page thirty-five. I also wanted to mention. Uh, with Jeannie being the first woman in SAA, that there is a women's intergroup, and they have just recently started a new website called saaforwomen.org, and I'll be sharing that link. And there is so much information there. Dear Grace columns, um, links to uh, MP3s for speaker shares, outreach committees, Lots of different stuff there. Section on meetings, sponsors, connections, diversity, women's stories, various events, and safety. So if you are interested, please check it out. And I will be putting links to both of those in the show notes. And lastly, I wanted to mention that in the next episode, we will be sharing Carrie M's story from the COSA side of this quarterly meeting. I've been receiving quite a few emails recently about becoming a guest on the show. Uh, tonight, as I'm recording this episode, I just uh, had an interview with someone from the UK, and uh, we've got a couple of guests coming from the UK in the next month or so. And I also had a question about, um, is this podcast a just a bay area thing and although the bay area sponsors this podcast we are worldwide so our audiences are all around the world and our guests are all around the world as well so this is not exclusively just the bay area i'm grateful for our bay area community but with the advent of zoom we have the ability to reach audiences and to find speakers from around the world. So if you are interested in being a guest with me or sending in a recording that you would like to share on the podcast, you can always email me at jason at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. And for general feedback about the podcast, you can leave that at feedback at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. And I'll be featuring some more of that feedback on a future episode. Wrapping up this episode, look forward to the next episode, part two of the quarterly speakers meeting coming up soon. I'm grateful for you tuning in and listening. And as always, keep coming back. The views and opinions contained in the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bay Area Intergroup or the ISO of SAA.